this kind of goes along. <laughs> so this, uh, let's see, let me get out of that, okay. So I'm just going to kind of go through it and I'm going to go through it fairly fast just because it is longer. So we'll get started here. So Seattle is one of the fastest growing large hub airports in North America, increasing passenger traffic by 41% in the last five years. Um, we've jumped to the eighth busiest airport in the U.S. in international passenger activity and um, customs facility. Um, let's see. I keep getting pop-ups here. We had basically we had to increase um, uh, because we have doubled our capacity in the past 10 years, growing 107 percent from 2007 to 2017. So we needed to expand. Um, SeaTech has been named the 10th most connected to international hub in the U.S. and since 2017. SeaTac has welcomed 12 new international services, including risk seven previously unserved international destinations, such as Dublin, Hong Kong, Mexico City, Munich, Osaka, and Singapore. So we're constantly expanding. So here in the Puget Sound region, we're experiencing tremendous growth in the past decade. Of course, with uh, 2020, you know, that has changed. You know, the, 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 Kind of knocked us on our heels for for a year. So what we're looking at right now is a typical day at SeaTac Airport, and that's pre-COVID. Um, but we are starting to see lines growing once again. So uh, it is picking back up. Um, so to help compensate for the increased growth, the Port of Seattle recognized our need to enhance the International Arrivals Facility, or what we call the IAAF. Um, we wanted to enhance the experience and recognize Pacific Northwest as not only a gateway for tourism, but also as an international business hub. So this project is going to increase the number of existing gates capable of serving international wide body aircraft from 12 to 20 and increase the number of passport check booths and kiosks from 30 to 80. The new IAF, IAF facility boasts a 450,000 square foot grand hall which will increase the number of uh, bag claims and carousels from uh, four to seven. This new expansion also features an iconic bridge that will span 85 feet over the existing taxi lane below and will span 900 feet connecting uh, the South Satellite Terminal to the top of the main building's Grand Hall at Concourse A. So over here would be looking towards the Grand Hall. When this is complete, our passengers, as they come across this, uh, our bridge here, they'll be able to have views of the Olympic Mountains and the buildings in Seattle. And if they look the other direction, they'll be looking right at, uh, right at uh, Rainier, uh, Mount Rainier. As part of the Port of Seattle's emphasis on our environmental stewardship and sustainability, the project is designed to achieve, achieve LEED V4 uh, designation. So, with all of this said, we have a very small area to do all the work in. So it's a big build, it's a small footprint. So you know, a lot of consideration had to be taken into how this was going to be done. And what we're looking at here is some of kind of our limitations. So if we look on the land side, we're looking at arrivals and departures is, you know, this is a, a barrier that's not going to leave. We have to do inside of that barrier. This is our tunnel. This is basically for employees access and our buses basically run in here and, and uh, bring our employees in as well as um, distribution for restaurants and that kind of thing. They will use this tunnel to go in and unload as the loading docks. And we've got the light rail that runs along the Eastern side. That's gonna cause a problem as well, constricting us there as well. And on the air side, this is just kind of giving you an idea of uh, this is a, basically a walkway that's going to go all the way around and actually is right now uh, and will connect to our bridge. We'll get into that a little bit uh, as we get into this a little bit farther. Um, so that's our air side building. Um, let's see. 
so with that, let me just go back. So it's going to have to be with a small footprint like this, all our material deliveries have been held to either just in time delivery or the product will have to be staged offsite and brought in as needed. So when they brought this material in, and obviously we can't do this, this is the area we got to excavate. So uh, kind of a, a mistake here in the beginning, but this is what I'm saying. You know, we, we got a big build and we need to get our feet wet to kind of feel how this is going to go. We need to have this material in play or in here where we can utilize it, but obviously it's not going to work. So they had to make some changes uh, to how they were going to uh, uh, proceed. Other things that came up, foundation removal and contaminated soil. So after starting excavation in the footprint area uh, for the installation of new utilities, we knew we had an old foundation to demolish um, and possible contaminated materials, but we ran into more contaminated than we originally expected. Shortly after excavation uh, began, the contractor uncovered some contaminated material next to the concourse aid building. And the port engineering team knew that this was the old location for the old Northwest Airlines hangar and that we were going to have some contamination in this area. But again, we were unsure of the extent. So what you see in this picture is the former hangar boiler room basement structure. So as you can imagine, excavation of this area was time consuming and tedious and you know, it's going to take up some area that we're going to need to get crews in and out of. Almost every bucket of this uh, from this area needed to be tested as it was removed. Here you can see one of our consultants and a helper. Uh, so every bucket that came out of here, they would be they would be testing, uh, see if it needed to be removed or how it was going to be uh, removed from site. So as we've already discussed, the space between the existing concourse A building, which is over here. Um, and the light rail is very constricted. So as we go around the corner uh, to the east and or southeast, it gets more and more constricted. Um, and we've got the added issue of having to excavate extra contaminated materials. The contractor had to stage all the bins to haul the contaminated off in the middle of the project, which conversely is also hard for the subcontractors working on site to store stage and stockpile materials. And this is basically the area where the contaminated soil is. So if you take a look here, you can get a bird's eye of exactly what we're talking about. Now we've got the piers poured here and forms set up um, in the excavation that has already started at this point. We've got good BMPs on our slopes, you know, so they're, this is in the winter time. Uh, so they are covering, uh, there's a pile over here that didn't get covered that was under the light rail, but they still needed to get it covered. So, but what I'm trying to say here is you can see the access. We've got a lot of different um, um, companies that need to get in here to do different work, electricians and so on and so forth, concrete pouring. So you can see the limitation and how we're bottlenecked here. Um, so talking about some of our BMPs, um, let's take a look at some of those now. Um, at Port of Seattle, we have a zero track out policy and it makes uh, working in this area and ingress, egress from the site a big challenge. So this photo was track out over the site perimeter berm, heading down into the tunnel with exposed drains. In this photo, you can also see a dewatering manifold that is uh, laying with uh, some lay flat hose hook to it, we'll talk about that in a little bit. What we had to do here is not only did the contractor have to come in and clean this up, uh, but they had to, we actually had to take the berm and move it a little bit farther down since we were kind of exceeding our, our work limits here. And we actually did have to work all the way down to the tunnel. So eventually, I mean, we'd have to eventually move it anyway. So why not just move it down here? What we did is we took this structure just inside, uh, there's a structure just inside here, we plugged it and then they used that for a sump and they were able to plug into their lines. Um, again, track out, big thing here. Um, so when we discuss track out at the port, the rule of thumb is if we can see it, then it's too much. So 
The airport works under our own individual uh, industrial permit. When the permit was developed, we made our rules and guidelines much stricter than, than the uh, MPDES permit. Um, so here you can see, and uh, you can see track out that's clearly coming off the site. Okay, and they are sweeping, they're doing what they can, but you can also see it's kind of foggy over here. So we're, we know that we're still getting track out. So that was a constant issue. Um, again, if when we say we can see it, then it's too much. That means even if you come off of the site and you've got uh, you know dust on the tires, we, we can see this, we know we've got track out. That's gonna remobilize if we had a rain event, and it's gonna go straight to our drains. Even though we've got a treatment system on site here, which we'll talk about shortly, um, you know, we still have to make sure that uh, our spalls are clean and that we're trying to come off this area as clean as possible. It's also, you know, can get airborne and be an air uh, or a fugitive dust issue as well. So here's one of the things that I'm talking about. Going into the rainy uh, part of the season, uh, we had asked the contractor to, uh, you know, to use uh, track out BMPs and uh, the changing weather here at SeaTac, we began to have issues. As you can see, the left is looking in from the entry gate um, and the contract called for a tire wash, but the contractor installed a grizzly and tried to control the track out and said, oh no, I think we can get it to work with just a grizzly. Well, we told them, no, we need a tire wash. Obviously it didn't work. So again, I asked them to install the tire wash per contract and uh, they came up with their next uh, uh, offering and installed falls before the grizzlies, okay? Of course, that didn't work, so we asked again for it. <laughs> yes, they added grizzlies, extra grizzlies along with this ball pen. It didn't work, it didn't work. So we, you know, had a non-compliance on the third try and we closed the project access until they brought the project uh, back into compliance. So the contractor at this point decided, hey, we better install a tire wash uh, to achieve compliance. Uh, it worked out well. This, this tire wash allowed for the permit requirements that were called out in our contract. And uh, basically the contract requirements call for two full tire rotations, sprayers underneath and on the sidewalls, and a self-cleaning tank system below to convey sediment out of the system. Um, and they also installed their spall pad on the ingress and egress sides. So they originally installed a single tire wash, found out that's not gonna be in compliance. So they had to install two tire washes in order to get two, two full rotations that was required. Um, since the tubs underneath separated the tire washes by about a foot or so, it actually benefited the contractor's requirement of two, two full tire rotations and actually made it a length of about two and a half. So it exceeded our expectations. And then they also added a treatment tank with bag filters and the Kaidazan injected system to treat water since the system was gonna be you know, long-term, they wanted to ensure that water was being treated in order to continuously recycle. And uh, which, you know, that way they're not backing it out all the time and keep trying to keep it clean. And it's just going to be more of a pain in the tail for them. Um, the contractor's environmental compliance officer, the ECO, inspected the water daily with the test uh, after startup and another test two hours before shutdown, as required by our contract specifications. And this was effective, uh, a good system. And other than a few issues with sprayers from time to time, and uh, the photo cells on the entrance to the uh, wash, this was, uh, this was actually doing a good job. Um, so since the project on the land side is linear and narrow, we'll talk a little bit about dewatering. Uh, linear and narrow, we needed to have the contractor propose a way to contain and treat their water. And we knew that the, you know, the only, site for storage tanks was gonna be uh, a, an area that was adjacent to the project on the south end of the footprint uh, next to the site entrance. And we've already talked about how, how tough of a site this is to you know, really have uh, 
a massive system right in the middle of this whole project. So uh, how are we going to get the water from one end from the north end to the south end? That was the next discussion. So and do it quickly and efficiently. So the contractor came up with uh, a dewatering system. And uh, they uh, came up with the watering manifold using black, a black HDP pipe welded together so they could run from one end of the project to the other, add extensions off the pipe in critical areas where they could plug into the system in flooded areas and open a valve to send the water to the treatment system. So basically they could run to their ponds wherever it's ponding, drop some lay flat hose, throw a pump in, send it to the uh, manifold and off the treatment it goes. So here's another kind of a look at um, how they uh, put these, this manifold together and then they have these stubs coming off and where they can hook in. And this went all the way around the project to, this is obviously towards the south end, but uh, this went all the way around the project and they were able to hook in wherever they needed to. So it was very efficient, uh, worked rather seamlessly as well. So. Um, this is a photo of pipe coming around the slope um, and it's headed to, up towards the north end of the project. You can see here where they've got a little trench where they had to take out their silt fence and reinstall it as we pushed out the boundary a little bit um, of the project. And then landslide treatment system. This is really cool how they did this. We uh, the tanks came in and they actually flew the tanks in, had to fly them into place um, in order to store site water. Uh, for the engineering calculations, we had to have seven storage tanks. Um, and it is a very tight space, even in this area where they were designated to, to set up, it's still a tight space. Uh, since the, the lot that the contractor was given for the treatment was sloped, the contractor had to figure out a way to level the tanks to properly use the tank efficiency or capacity to be efficient and meet the engineered quantities. Uh, the contractor decided to excavate and construct new cement tank pads, um, allowing them to, to level out the tanks and have more room for the piping below the tanks for the treatment system. And filters are, of course, located directly in the system, located directly behind the tanks. So the contractor brought in water tectonics uh, to handle the treatment of the site water. The system installed uh, used electrocoagulation, enhanced filtration technology to remove total suspended solids, heavy metals, emulsified oils, bacteria, and other contaminants from the water, and was extremely effective in treating the site water that we sent to them. So with this project, you know, one of the things, another BMP that we need to talk about is always housekeeping. Um, obviously, this first picture is showing you that, um, first of all, to, to proceed with this, uh, we are in a very public area. Uh, so having making sure housekeeping and fugitive dust uh, are under control is number one priority. Um, this I actually walked upon one of my day, one of the days I was out uh, on a site visit, and this was telling me that basically we were overloading this, overloading these things. And where did all the water that came out of this? Where did that go? So we had another NCR non-compliance here. Uh, the contractor got rid of it, and they actually changed the way they did things from then on. So um, also, you know, we had a contractor that did. Um, this is the fireproofing, um, and I was had had many problems with this contractor, but I think we finally got got it under control. Um, this is them trying to uh, put down these tarps to catch some of the fireproofing that they had to knock off for the electrical uh, to run electrical pipes. Um, obviously, not sufficient. The good thing was is this was under the overhang of the new building. Um, so we weren't getting any water at this time, but it needed to be cleaned up. And we, we had several instances where we had to talk to them about this as well. So it's just something they had to keep up on and maintain. Um, and then the roof, this is obviously the new building over here as well. So, uh, and then we 
have in order to do work on this building. They still had a little bit of work that they had to do on the old building as well. This is basically out of sandbags. This is rock out of some sandbags that they were using to keep the uh, plastic from blowing. And uh, so just housekeeping in general, they had to make sure that we didn't get any of this material into our roof drain. So that was another non-compliance there. And as you can see, housekeeping is always critical on projects. The photo on the left shows just how exhausting it can be. Uh, I'm not sure if he's sleeping or if he was the poor guy who was designated to keep the pallet from tipping over, to be honest with you. So also the containment under the tote was not in compliance. Uh, this was another issue that we walked upon that had to be taken care of. Um, again, this was our fireproofers. Um, and it also, the, the containment needed to be in 110% of containment. Uh, and it wasn't, so we had uh, an issue there as well. So housekeeping was an issue from time to time on this project. Uh, utility installation on the slope. Now this is in kind of a tricky area, um, but we had to, and, and again, it's right on International Boulevard. So, so a public view is everything. You know, we need to make sure we had no dust issues. And, but also we had the slope here that we knew we had to be taken care of uh, going into the winter. We had to make sure that we have everything phased right. Uh, so that we weren't going to be having huge erosion control events. So obviously, we've got the sill fence at the bottom. Um, but you can see what we did have during a summer, kind of a summer rain event that we had, and the way that it kind of washed down the slope. So um, plastic was deployed on the next rain event. And also, this is right under the light rail, which you can't see. It's up above us a little bit. So it was kind of tricky. We had to have people out there to, uh, when the big excavators were in there to do this work, they had to stand underneath it to make sure we're going to clear it and not hit it. So we had space constraints, you know. So with all that said, the slide show, or, or this actually shows the IAF building as we're further along in the process and we are getting ready to um, re, um, reconstruct the slope, restructure it. And as, uh, in, uh, the irrigation hasn't been installed, and we're doing the slope tracking currently. We can see the slope tracking. And we're doing this before the hydro seed, and then the hydro seed was applied before going into the winter, and the contractor covered it with clear plastic and sandbags. And this picture was taken closer to the spring. It shows the plastic created a good greenhouse effect through the winter and the snow and the cold that we had. And uh, we did have quite a bit of snow that year for Seattle anyway. So, um, but through it all, it came out fairly well. We had a few spots that we had to repair once we removed it, but that was pretty quick and effective. Uh, so as we progressed into the summer, we were able to achieve our 95% vegetation coverage, which we wanted to see at least 80 or 85%. Asphalt walkway was installed and completed, and we were starting to discuss with the contractor possibly stabilizing this uh, area. And to, by stabilizing, I mean that the, uh, they no longer have to monitor it and uh, uh, that we would be able to take it back to uh, under the port's wing as a finished product. This shows the landscaping. Uh, you can see our tunnel here is previous pictures you saw before it was before the building was even here. This is all geo cell that was filled with uh, was filled with uh, crushed rock for infiltration. And then our landscape that's in and our new trees that have been installed. And um, next, all newly installed storm drainage was cleaned out and they came in and jetted it. And uh, they were able to pull the plugs that were installed so that we kept all our site water on site and going to the treatment system. So we were able to stabilize it out and uh, they were able to take the drain socks out. And uh, this is about the time we were able to start removing the treatment system. And okay, so air side, working on the air side of this project was much like the land side, it's no easy task. Um, so we've got even more constricted spaces on this side due to 
uh, you know, planes on the taxi lanes, and we had to make sure that we were staying out of their their space. And uh, uh, so once again, the, the footprint is uh, in this area is pretty small. All work is done in phases to keep as many gates open as possible. Uh, this is actually a pour. This pour is for the uh, face of the would be the east tower of our bridge. And then that pour obviously went into the evening and to the next day. <laughs> it's quite a quite a long ordeal. Um, but this is also looking over. You can look over to the other side and you can see the barriers over there. This is where the uh, west side pour is going to be happening. But you can see the space. It's very constricted. It's very limited to, uh, you know, uh, all the equipment that they need to get in there and all the pumping in the, that they have to do. So a lot of high traffic. Um, this is just a brief video and I'll just start it so I can, but the, the sound quality isn't great. So I'll just. Right now we're over here. We'll just, uh, so we're, we're taking a look at the uh, east side of the bridge. This is with the bridge actually installed and looking over to the west. Uh, you can see their lay down is is quite a bit uh, the same as far as uh, area, um, and everything is just packed in here. We have no way of, you know, gaining any room in these areas. We are totally held to, uh, like I said, phasing of these areas so that we don't take up too many gates. And basically, looking around, you know. It, Sorry for my camera work, but uh, everything was clean and in place, and and they actually did a good job of housekeeping housekeeping on this side, which is very critical on the air side. We can't have any pod, foreign object debris, or anything like that. So nothing can be blowing around and uh, getting airborne around planes and no dust, uh, that kind of deal. And working on these projects has its own issues, such as like I said, housekeeping pod. Uh, concrete demo, concrete saw cutting, and of course dewatering to name a few. In this photo, you can see the contractors installed the asphalt berm for perimeter protection in all areas throughout the project on the air side. Uh, we go with, we, we like to go with the uh, asphalt berm because we do not recognize a straw wattle as being effective BMP on concrete or asphalt surfaces uh, at the port. They just, because of floating reasons, we just have too many uh, failures with that on concrete and asphalt. Uh, so that's why you see on a lot of our projects, you'll see the asphalt berm. So you can see a perimeter and berm that, uh, you can hardly see it, but around the edges, you can see a perimeter berm that's running all the way around. You see these, um, uh, this asphalt, this is basically slot drain protection. The contractor said, well, we gotta, we said, we don't, we don't care how you do it. You just have to make sure there's a BMP over our slot drains. So what they did, came up with is they put fabric down and then they put asphalt, uh, cold patch asphalt over the top of it, something they, they could fix quickly. And it was actually very effective in this, uh, in this setting. So plus they were able to drive over it and, and uh, be able to move around instead of like sandbagging it and that kind of thing. So containment, you know, came, containment was an issue. This is another video that probably doesn't have very good sound, but I'll just go over a few. Um, this uh, containment, a lot of contractors would use these city poles, which are, you know, they're fine as long as they're used properly. This one actually had a crack in it that um, during my site walk I saw, so they had to, uh, they had to remove that and uh, uh, put a new one underneath of it. Their sprayers are in containment. Um, and we just, the reason we're so critical is because here we've got a, a, a drain structure and a slot drain here. So, you know, other, otherwise the housekeeping was, was fairly good in this area. I didn't really have an issue with it other than a few uh, non-compliance issues this is one of their so, okay saw cutting and slurry from saw cutting can cause a lot of issues uh as seen in this photo the contractor has been doing some saw cutting and left a lot of slurry on the concrete not a very clean operation 
and this uh, the slurry can remobilize during the next rain event. Also, if vehicles drive through this, they will track out pH material and pulverize the material so that it could become airborne in wind or jet blasts. Um, so this site needed to be thoroughly cleaned before the end of the day, and uh, and the slurry bar slurry barrels needed to be in, in containment going forward. So we made an adjustment there, and the contractor uh, started doing better housekeeping. Uh, so this is kind of a joke. This tank um, was actually hidden, and I had found it, and uh, no containment underneath of this tank. And the reason it's kind of a joke is because this tank was hidden a lot. Um, I don't, I can't even remember how many times I found this tank in different areas without containment. Uh, and uh, so they they had a non-compliance issue there and they had containment sitting right here, you know, so uh, whether that could fit in there or not, I, I don't know, but we had another containment beneath it here, uh, full of water. So the contractor had to pull the water out and take it off site and dispose of it properly according to our pollution prevention plan spec. And <laughs> the housekeeping, it wasn't too bad, but you know, you have, some junk laying around that's obviously a blue in from somewhere. And if it blew in, it can blow out. So they need to take care of that. Uh, this is basically a picture of the work that's happening on the air side. This is uh, them going in and pulling out some of our ramp concrete. And uh, this is for new utilities, foundation, uh, roof drains, electrical upgrades new storm system structures that we install uh, for the new. Uh, and then you can see over here, this is the new corridor that is being built. This will actually go all the way down to the, wish I had a better picture, but it will go all the way down to the bridge, the new bridge. So it goes from A7 all the way around to A13. Um, so basically that's, wish I had more, excavation pictures uh, in, on this side. But uh, basically that's, that's in a nutshell, that's uh, all of our heavy civil work. And some of the BMPs and stuff that we uh, did and the uh, treatment system and that kind of thing. So I'm kind of winding it down a little bit here. I've got some really cool videos. This is, you know, obviously we're talking about our new our new building that we're putting together. And I thought these were just kind of interesting videos here. So I'll just play this. So basically this had to be built down at Cargo 2, the bridge, the midsection. And then we had to move it from Cargo 2, which is up north, all the way to the south. So with all of that, you know, it takes a village. You know, we had a lot of people work on this project. Actually, we're still going on it. We're getting closer to our grand opening. This is just a, a lunch that we had to recognize all the crews. And, but um, 
it takes a lot of people and a lot of hard work, but we are getting closer to our grand opening. Uh, we're in punch list right now, so hopefully this will be opening soon. And uh, as you come through SeaTac, if you're doing inter inter any international flying, uh, you will be able to see our new uh, IAF building. And uh, it's really pretty awesome. I got a, another brief video that I'm going to show you that will kind of end this whole presentation. But I think it gives you a real overview of what this is kind of going to going to look like in the end. So let's just go with that here. So with that, I want to thank everybody. I know I kind of slammed this. <laughs> I had, this is a pretty long presentation. I had to kind of uh, shorten it a little bit and talk a little bit faster than I wanted to. But uh, I hope everybody enjoyed this uh, presentation. I would like to say special thanks to SeaTac Airport Media Relations Group for a lot of their great videos, that, a couple of them anyway, that were used in this as well. So uh, with that, thank you, and uh, I'll open it up. Troy, we have a question from Kelvin. SeaTac uh, has its own industrial stormwater general permit for the discharge from the air site construction. Did you have to treat the discharge to the um, ISGP permit benchmark limit? So we used the, I think it was to the GULD limits. Um, so five NTU, I, I believe, was our, what our permit calls for. So. 
that's what we treated to for our industrial uh, individual industrial permit. If, if you don't mind, I'm going to jump in here too. Oh, so, go ahead. Yeah, the, the project, the outside the airfield project, as, as Troy mentioned, everything was uh, went to the uh, electric coagulation system. And so the uh, GULD number Troy was talking about is to meet the ecology discharge permit, uh, permit limits or discharge limits. On the airfield side, basically it was a no discharge site. So all of the right. berms and everything were set up, as Troy had mentioned, to keep stormwater from going into the live storm system on the airfield. So that's, and, and that's generally how things are handled out at the airfield. So is that? Okay. Yeah, that helps. Uh, how about the heavy metals on the, uh, the side where you have an EC systems? Do you have to look into that too, or you are just for your permit, you just have to look into turbidity? Um, on which side? On, I think on the land side where you have the electrical regulation systems, right? Uh, you probably, is Lisa on actually? She's, I think she's on. Uh, she had to leave. Oh, she uh, did, okay. Yeah, under the, under the, uh, I'm sorry, I just retired from the port. Troy has my old job and I, I just have to <laughs> jump in, sorry. <laughs> yeah, no worries. Um, yeah, the, um, the port is only required to treat for turbidity on okay, turbidity, it. TPH, uh, pH for construction sites. Got it. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions I can answer? I mean, Troy can answer. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Dave. <laughs> All right. Uh, well, let's let's uh, call it a presentation. Thank you, Troy. That was that was very good, very informative. And um, just a reminder: this presentation is recorded, as all of our lunch and learns are, and will be posted on the chapter YouTube site, which can be accessed through our LinkedIn page um, and also the web page. So, thank you all very much.